It's not just the design elements like font or color that persuade us when we examine visual media, but of course there's also data included in any visual argument as well. We should think about the way that data is expressed through various different visual mediums. You might be familiar with visual representations like the pie chart, which work well for displaying complete percentages. Alternatively, you might think about the way that a bar graph is helpful when not displaying a percentage, but displaying an increasing trend. You might also think about how a line graph can be helpful for displaying material and media that change over time. And you might think about how timelines are familiar representations to show evolution. In this sense, many of these have their own genre conventions of their own. And it's not just graphs which convey evidence in a particular visual media or message, but also symbols and characters, even logos as well. And as we think about how visual media and messages ask audiences to make particular inferences, we should think about how they require us to reason from forms that we've previously discussed, like the deductive forms of reasoning, causal generalization or reasoning from sign, and those inductive forms we've described like the argument by analogy, example, or correlation. And of course, as we're creating our own visual media and messages, we should be sure to cite our sources and observe copyright rules and regulations. And thinking about how even a logo can extend credibility, you might think about how having something like a government stamp on an organization, or even something like As Seen on TV, or sponsored by Shark Tank, or as we're seeing perhaps now, sponsored by the Center for Disease Control, each of those various different logos and brands that are stamped to the object might help increase the credibility or associations it has, its brand identity, and so on. So when you're analyzing visual messages, you can carefully examine all of the relations between the Tuleman model, the claim, the data, the warrants, the qualifiers, and the reservations. Even if those things aren't explicitly expressed or made clear in the video or campaign itself, they're oftentimes implied and inferred based on the audience's shared knowledge, the history of that message design and conventions, or what we might be able to learn about the sender, the artist, and the creator. Remember, to return to our definition of rational argument, we noted even in the beginning of the semester that a claim, data, and warrant doesn't necessarily mean it's accurate or true. There can indeed be claims, data, and warrants expressed to sound very rational, but are in fact deceptive. Those forms of fallacious reasoning extend to visual argumentation as well. We should be attuned to those argumentative fallacies in visual media, and while we'll spend some time doing that today, it's important you as visual consumers continue to sharpen your visual and media literacy skills to identify these forms of visual fallacy in the future, especially as these forms of technology and visual manipulation grow ever more sophisticated. So when we're analyzing visual claims, it's important we acknowledge that in the stream of a multimedia clip, there might be a number of different claims made and a number of different arguments contained therein. In that sense, as analysts of those visual media, our job is to spot those key claims and the representations or symbols that are used that best distinguish the argument. So there's a web of argumentative claims in these visual media and messages, and communication scholars are tasked with discerning the most important claims and the various forms of symbols and visual representations that are used to support those claims. As complex as these claims are, and as connected as they are to other forms of media and messages, it's important that we think about the context that they are existing in. You should think critically about the images you're analyzing both for the upcoming campaign and as you engage with various different forms of media for the remainder of your life. Image claims, whether they're on the news, whether they're included in something like a PSA, or whether they're just an art piece that you see on a gallery wall, require a level of subjective interpretation and analysis. And it's important that we as scholars of communication and those who engage in media sharpen our skills to do that. We briefly described previously how visual messages use a variety of forms of data to persuade their audiences. These forms of data include things like expert testimony, Perhaps having somebody with a lab coat act as a doctor, even if in small print beneath it says that it's not a real doctor, that serves to lend a certain credibility and present a certain form of expertise. Of course, we can also think about the way that infomercials will often use real testimonials from individuals to function as examples of the argument. And of course, we can think about how different text presented on the screen might make arguments of empirical fact or even present statistics with different fancy transitions as those numbers pop onto the screen and disappear. In any instance, when we're examining the data and visual design messages, we're thinking about the way that these appeal to various different audience beliefs, values, and attitudes. In this sense, as scholars of communication, we believe that visual messages and media use data to appeal to the various different Aristotelian appeals that you should be familiar with, including ethos, logos, and pathos. 
There's a growing body of evidence that indicate that humans crave information visually and that when information is presented to them visually, it tends to supplement and better their education. There's evidence that indicates that people recall about 10% of what they hear, 20% of what they read, but 80% of what they see and do. And so in that sense, visual information can be a really important way to help grab viewers' attention and help them recall and retain important information in the future. One thing I find interesting to note is the way visual media and information have evolved over time to include new genres and conventions. One thing that you see here is an information graphic or infographic. Infographics have grown especially common in the last 20 years as new technologies have allowed organizations to very easily produce sophisticated visual messages which demonstrate their campaign intentions. Similarly, you might think about the way that BuzzFeed has organized a number of its stories in list form. That use of the visual list representation and convention has allowed them to convey a whole lot of information very quickly because audiences are able to infer the order and priority of various different news, media, and stories. So you're probably familiar with Photoshop and the levels that different Snapchat filters can go to to manipulate and distort personal appearance, but of course it's also important to note that it's not just personal appearance that can be manipulated by things like Photoshop or various different lens filters, but it's also information and our understanding of that information that can be distorted visually as well. And so as we're analyzing visual media and information, we should ask ourselves what evidence is used to support those claims and whether the evidence and associations to support those claims are effective or credible. One thing to be wary of when evaluating visual media are those messages that rely on overly sensationalized or emotional appeals. These overly sensationalized or emotional appeals often lead to exaggerated claims that lack the types of grounds or warrants that would establish the types of arguments we would aspire to analyze in this class or even to share with our friends and family in our own correspondence and communication. They're simply not valid, and though they may be funny, we should note when they're fallacious and when they're intended to deceive or mislead audiences.